Welcome to another episode of Gospelize with Greg Steer. We're going through the Life in Six Words series, and this is the third episode as Greg is breaking down the acrostic God, our sins, paying everyone life. This episode is all about sin, and sins cannot be removed by good deeds. It's the very thing that grates against our human nature. We want to fix it. We want to do right. We want to do good to make things right, but the reality is we can't. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. So I know I'm looking forward to, I'm sure you're looking forward to as well, Greg diving into this deep theological truth of how dependent we are on the grace of God. As a reminder, make sure you're downloading the resources that go with the podcast, the listening guide, the discussion guide. You can download the transcript so you can teach this content to your students, but make sure you're really wrestling through and processing through. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Now, without further ado, my good friend, Greg Steer. Thirty plus years ago when I was a pastor, believe it or not, we used to partner with a local haunted house every October. Now, the owner of the haunted house was a Christian, um, and they wouldn't have witches or demons out of biblical conviction, but they would have werewolves and chainsaw-wielding madmen, because that's super like biblical, right? I don't know. But we used it as an outreach. We, we said, hey, there's 20,000 people that go through this haunted house every year. Why don't we give the gospel to every single one of them? So every single person that went through this haunted house, by the way, it was Denver's number one rated haunted house. So it was a scary, scary place. But we called it a preview to hell. We'd share the gospel and I'd guide them through. And one of the things that um, made this haunted house work is when you got into this two-level barn, it felt absolutely inescapable. Now, I knew where all the escape places were where we could go in an emergency, but everybody that went through, they felt like they were locked in, like the original escape room, right? And nobody felt like they could escape. I can't tell you how many people peed their pants in that haunted house looking for a way out. Listen, in a sense, We're all kind of locked in this haunted house, so to speak, this escape room. And it feels like there's no way out. Uh, Sins, we've been talking about sins cannot be removed by good deeds. God created us to be with him. Our sins separate us from God. And those sins cannot be removed by good deeds. We're running down corridors looking for open doors to kind of get out of this sin house. And we can't find a way out through our good deeds. There's no way out in and of ourselves. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves, uh, in and of ourselves to get rid of our sins. And this, this salvation is a gift of God, not by good works, not one person will be able to get into heaven and say, I'm here because I'm a good person. This is not by works so that no one can boast. You know what? If we could get to heaven by our good deeds, every one of us would say, look at me, look at what I did. But none of us are going to be able to say that. We're going to say, look to Jesus. <laughs> look, look at Jesus. Look at what he did. He paid the price with his own blood on the cross so that we could receive the free gift of eternal life. So let's talk a little bit about this next step. We're going through this Life in Six Word series. We talked about our sins separating us from God. Now we're going to talk about sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Why? Why can't sin be removed by good deeds? Let me give you a couple of reasons. Number one, because we could never be good enough to enter into God's presence. Revelation 21, 27 is a pretty stark verse that talks about the requirement to get into heaven. It says this, nothing impure will ever enter into it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful, you ever do anything shameful? I have. Or deceitful, you ever said a lie? I have. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Basically what it's saying, you know, we always say, well, you know, what if, what if you, you know, I'm a pretty good person, you know, maybe just committed a few uh, little white lies. There's no such thing as a little white lie. Every sin, as we learned in the last podcast, is a direct assault on the character of God. If you just, you lived a perfect life, but one white lie, it'll send you to hell. You cannot enter in to heaven. 
Our attempts to get to heaven by our own good deeds, have, you know, many preachers have used many illustrations uh, to show how absurd that would be. Like, it'd be like trying to long jump the Grand Canyon or pole vault to the moon. We'd always come up short no matter how hard we tried. And we come up short when it comes to trying to earn our way into heaven. Our good deeds just cover up our sinfulness. In fact, the illustration I often use at Dare to Share with teenagers is if I were to bake you a cake, there's a strong possibility I would burn that cake. And if I burn that cake, I could take white frosting and cover over the burnt cake and still give you the cake. But the white frosting on the burnt cake doesn't change the fact that the cake is burnt, right? And our quote unquote good deeds don't change the fact that underneath it all, we've been burnt by sin and selfishness and that we are depraved and deprived people. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds because we could never be good enough. That, that standard is perfection. The second reason is this, because the law is a mirror, not a ladder. The law is a mirror, not a ladder. Have you ever fallen off a ladder? I fell off a ladder. I remember I was, I was roofer for eight years. I was roofing for roofing uh, by Sanchez, and we had just showed up at this new job, and it was in the middle of winter, and we were in Colorado, so there was snow on the ground, and the owner of the company was talking to the owner of the home and saying, "Hey, here's the top quality job that we do. We're going to come. We're going to we're going to you know we're going to shovel off all the snow on your roof. We're going to let it dry, and then we're going to take off the old roof and put on a new roof. And I have a very sharp crew, and they're going to just do hard work. And I'm just trying to work hard. I take that ladder and and I." put it up against the house and I climb up that ladder and I'm going to begin the work show this lady that my boss knows what he's talking about that I know what I'm talking about what I didn't realize is I placed that ladder on ice and I got to the top rung and while he's telling her how professional we are that ladder slipped out and I remember jumping back you know flying in the air thinking to myself this ain't going to be good and thank the Lord no kidding there was a hot tub with a hot tub cover on it. I landed on the hot tub cover, which caved in into the water. And I looked over at the lady. I'm like, we are professionals. And she's like, oh, my goodness. And my boss was mortified. Anyway, I didn't get fired. But I fell off the ladder. Listen, if you think of the law, the Ten Commandments, think of ten rungs, right? Those commandments, all of us fall off the ladder of the law, right? If we try to earn our way into heaven, it's, it's even more dramatic. Not only do we fall off, it's like that ladder extends into e eternity and we have no limbs, right? We have no way to keep the law truly and fully, right? So here's what Romans 3.20 says about the law. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And when you ask the average person on the street, hey, what do you have to do to get to heaven? Hey, be a nice person, you know, live a good life. Basically, what they're saying is, you know, be, you know love God, love others. I mean, the summation of the law, here's the problem. None of us keep the law truly and fully. The law is not a ladder that we climb into heaven because none of us could climb that ladder right? It's a mirror that shows us how messed up we are. Through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So to try to save yourself by keeping the Ten Commandments or whatever other list of rules is absurd. My old pastor, Yankee Arnold, used to say it this way. When you wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror, your hair's matted, you got stuff in your eyes, maybe boogers in your nose, you need shave, you know, to shave. You don't look in the mirror and then take the mirror off the wall, right? And clean yourself up with it and shave with it, right? The mirror exposes the mess, but you are shaved by grace. Sorry, I couldn't resist. That's a dad joke. It's a preacher dad joke, but I had to say it. You are saved by grace. So the law exposes our, how messed up we are, but we are saved, cleaned up, transformed by God's grace. So the law was never meant to save anyone. I think this is the beauty of the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 16 to 26. You know, Jesus uh, is there and the rich young ruler comes up and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And 
He said, why do you call me good? No one's good but God. You, you basically said, do you, do you believe I'm God, right? Because uh, I am. Uh, and he said, what must I do? He's, he gives a couple of different commands, you know, honor your father and mother, you know, do not lie, do not steal, different things like that. And he goes, all these I've kept up from my youth. And then Jesus said, good, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me and you'll have riches in heaven. Now, Jesus did not all of a sudden switch to a workspace paradigm. He didn't all of a sudden say, okay, here's what you got to do to get to heaven. It's no longer faith in me, right? It's you got to you got to keep the law. What Jesus was saying is he was, what he was doing was holding up the mirror of the law. He said, you think you're good because you kept a couple of the commandments? I want you to look at the true and full law. Because if you truly love God with your, all your heart, soul, mind, and might, and you truly love your neighbor as yourself, you'd be more than willing to sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow after me. And it's interesting, that passage says that the rich young ruler left sorrowing because he had great riches. I personally think we may see the rich young ruler in heaven because I think for the first time in his life, he realized by looking in the mirror that Jesus was holding up of the law, I am a sinner. I'm not nearly as good as I thought. I am a wretched man. I am messed up. I love my stuff more than I love God and more than I love others. He realized he was a sinner. And it's just hard for me not to think that the same Jesus who, who lifted up that mirror of the law would later on either himself or send some of his disciples to share with this man who knew now he was a sinner the grace of God that can save him. So the law is a mirror that shows us how messed up we are. I'll use a different illustration. I used to go to this dentist that used this dye on our teeth. And I remember the first time this dentist used the dye on my teeth, they were asking, hey, do you, are you brushing and flossing? Oh, brush, but flossing, you know, I'm, you know, try to be consistent. And I'm trying, you know, I'm like, I'm not very good at flossing, but, he, but I'm like, yeah, I floss once in a while. And, and the dentist said, well, we're going to put this dye on your teeth and it will expose, it will expose what has not been brushed and what has not been flossed. And I'll never forget the words of the dentist. The dentist said, and hey, Greg, the dye don't lie. The dye don't lie. And that dentist put the dye in my teeth and made me smile into a mirror and I saw all the spots that weren't brushed well and were not flossed well. I was a sinner in the hands of an angry dentist. I realized I was, I was exposed. That dye did not lie. It showed me my faults. The law does not lie. It shows us our faults. And Jesus, even making it more clear in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, I always say it's easy to find out the exact spot where the Sermon on the Mount took place because it was a beautiful, terrifying sermon. <laughs> and you, can, you could tell where it was because I'm sure there's flowers growing everywhere because everyone who listened to the Sermon on the Mount pooped their pants out of terror. <laughs> Because it's a beautiful and terrifying sermon because Jesus is showing the full extent of the law in Matthew 5. He says, you've heard it said to the law, do not commit adultery. I tell you, if you've ever lusted after a woman, you've committed adultery with her in your mind. All the dudes there realize immediately, okay, I'm an adulterer in God's view, the perfect full view and true view of the law. He said, you've heard it say, do not commit a murder. I, I tell you, if you've ever been angry with somebody, you've murdered them in your mind. You've heard it said, uh, love your friends, but I tell you, love your enemies. And then he sums it all up with this one inch Bruce Lee power punch to the soul. In Matthew 5, 48, here's the standard. Be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. That's what I call a holy crap moment. Like, oh my goodness, we all fall short. What's the standard? The standard is the law, which reflects the character and perfection and righteousness of a holy, holy, holy God. 
and we miss the mark. The law is a mirror, not a ladder. The law that Jesus held up on the Sermon on the Mount that terrified his listeners. The law that Jesus held up to the rich young ruler that made him realize he was a sinner is the same law that we look into, that Jesus is holding up in our soul, and we realize if we're honest, we all fall short. Here's another reason why good deeds cannot save us, because even our good deeds come from selfish motives. God doesn't just judge our our actions, right? We, we think, well, I'm good, and we look at people that do good actions, we think they're good. Listen, according to Matthew 5, 27 and 28, he will judge our thoughts. According to 1 Corinthians 4, 5, he will judge not just our thoughts, but our motives, According to Matthew 12, 36 through 37, he will judge our words. By our words will be acquitted. By our words will be condemned. He will, it says he will judge every careless word that comes out of our mouth. And then according to Revelation 20, 11 through 15, he will judge our actions. And even what we call good actions or holy actions, here's what the Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6 about how God views our righteous acts. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And if you get into the Hebrew meaning of that that term filthy rags, it's just gross, but it means used uh, menstrual rags. That's how God looks at our good deeds. He's so holy that he looks at our good deeds like used menstrual rags. Used tampons would be the modern equivalent. That's how holy God is because he doesn't just see our our outward actions. He sees the thoughts behind them. He sees the words we say when nobody else is, is listening. And he knows the motives of our hearts. So all these good people throughout history, there's no one good apart from Christ in them and apart from Jesus himself. See, when it comes to believing, receiving, and sharing the good news of Jesus, the idea that sins cannot be removed by good deeds is a must because somehow it is embedded into the soul of every human that they could earn God's favor. It was embedded into Cain's soul, Adam and Eve's son. There was Cain, there was Abel. Abel learned from the sacrifice that was made so that his mom and dad could be covered in the Garden of Eden, which represented the future coming of Christ, that that God would accept a blood sacrifice. So he made that blood sacrifice. Cain did not learn that. His brother, he did not learn that. You know what he did? He went out and he tried to earn God's favor. He planted in a field and he raised these vegetables and this fruit and he worked hard by the sweat of his brow and as a result of his labor over months and months and months, he brought these vegetables, this fruit, this this produce to God and God rejected it. And God didn't reject it because he doesn't like vegetables. He didn't reject it because he didn't like fruit. He rejected it because that, those fruits and vegetables, all that stuff represented Cain's human effort. What God accepted was Abel's sacrifice of blood because it pointed forward to Jesus coming and his sacrifice on the cross. God rejects all of our human effort. doesn't matter What religion? You look at religions. Religions, if you want to get to heaven or paradise or nirvana or whatever, there's always self-effort. In Mormonism, it's the law and the covenants. In Hinduism, it's achieved by one of three ways. The way of works, the way of knowledge, or the way of devotion. In Buddhism, it's the four noble truths. In Islam, it's the five pillars of Islam. There's a ladder to every every heaven or paradise or nirvana that you can earn by your good deeds, by your religious acts, by your commitment, by your selflessness, by your whatever. But only Christianity says no, no, no. It's not a ladder that you can climb. It's a cross that Jesus actually climbed down from heaven to live the perfect life we could not live and die on a death that we deserved. It's not achieved by what we do. It's received by what Christ has done. The solution for our sin problem is not trying, but trusting. But embedded in us is this desire to earn it. But if we could do that, we would, again, we would boast about ourselves in heaven, not about Christ. I remember for me as a little kid in North Denver, I was told 
by one of my Sunday school teachers, if you want to get to heaven, you have to confess all your sins. So I remember obsessively confessing, a little OCD confessor. I would confess all my sins as a kid, you know, and then I would curse in my mind and I'd confess that. And then I'd curse again and I'd confess that. And I thought if I died between the confession, confession and the cursing, I'd go uh, straight to hell. If I died between the cursing and confessing, I'd go straight to hell. And finally, someone told me, listen, it's not by confessing all your sin. It's by faith in Jesus. And by the way, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, you've, you've heard the way. The way is not the way of the ladder of trying to obey the Ten Commandments or the law and the covenants or the four noble truths or the five pillars of Islam. It's not by any human way of earning God's favor. Listen, there's only one who has God's favor, that's Jesus. And Jesus died on the cross in our place for our sin, and he extends us this favor, this grace, this gift of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. So if you've never put your faith in Christ, trust in him now. For those of you who are believers, that same faith that saves you, sanctifies you. And out of that sanctification, guess what? Good deeds will come. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We've already read the first two verses. Let's read the, the final verse. Let's put it all together. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. In other words, you don't pay for it. When you receive a gift, you receive it freely. You, your, your parents or your, or your spouse or your kids don't give you a gift and then say that'll be you know $79, please. It's a gift that they pay for. So the gift of salvation, it's a, it's a gift of God to us, not by good works, not by the latter, so that no one can boast. Now here's verse 10. So where do good deeds fit in? For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So once you're a believer in Christ, know this, that God, before the beginning of the world, has prepared some good works for you to do. He is a calling for your life. And he has good works for you to do. Not in order to earn your salvation. That's already been earned by the blood of Christ. But in order to live out your salvation. As gratefulness because of your salvation, you live out these good works. I don't know how many of you have seen the 1991 movie City Slickers. If you've not seen it, it's worth the watch. If you've seen it, watch it again. Billy Crystal plays the role of Mitch who's a baby boomer who decides to go on a cattle drive with his buddies trying to discover the meaning of life. He is having a midlife crisis. And he's out with Curly, who's the, you know, the trail leader, this tough cowboy uh, played by Jack Palance. And they're having a conversation about the meaning of life. And, he, and Curly goes, you know what the meaning of life is? And Mitch says what? And he says this. He holds up just one finger, this. And he goes, what's that? He says, here's the meaning of life, one thing. What's that one thing? He said, that's what you got to figure out. And that kind of became the key scene of the whole movie. What's that one thing? See, God has got one thing. He's got, he's got a calling for you to accomplish. But then he's got many good things, many good works for you to do along the way so that you can bring honor and glory to him. We need good works of telling people about Jesus, of, of serving others in the body of Christ, of being kind to everyone, loving our enemies, uh, serving people every day along the way. We do these good works because Jesus did the greatest work when he died on the cross and paid the price for our sin. And those good works flow out of our salvation. We don't do them in order to receive or achieve salvation. We do them because Christ achieved it for us on the cross. And we're just grateful. So, as a believer in Christ, I challenge you, find out that calling, that one thing, and live out those good works because you're so grateful for what Jesus did for you on the cross. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Father, I just thank you so much that you created us to be with you. Lord, my heart breaks that our sins separate us from you. And I know down deep in my soul, Lord, those sins 
cannot be removed by our good deeds. But I'm so thankful, Lord, that we, we're going through this tough part of the gospel message that we, we are dead and we are destined for hell and there's nothing we can do about it. We're stuck in that haunted house, that escape room with no escape in and of ourselves. But I am so grateful. We are so grateful for what Jesus did for us on the cross. That he made the way out. He provided the gift of salvation through simple faith in Jesus Christ. May we never get tired of this story. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks so much, Greg. Again, another great talk. This time about sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Hey, I'm John Burdett. This is Jason Lamb. And we're here for some takeaways, tips, and tools. And Jason, you know, a big takeaway for me, is just as Greg was talking about, you know, it's a gift. You know, the gift of salvation uh, versus it's not a it's not a work that we can achieve. It's a gift that we receive. Literally, when he was talking, I was thinking about my favorite gift I ever received as a kid. I was like 10 years old. I didn't think there was any chance of it, but my parents knew I wanted a Nintendo, man, the original NES, baby. And my, I, I, it was a total surprise on Christmas morning. I opened it up. I was blown away. And then what my mom do? She said it'd be 200 bucks. No, she didn't. Of course, she did not say that. Of course not. Because it's going to be the worst it Christmas ever. It wouldn't have been a gift, right? It was such an awesome gift. And it just, I think about that story when I think about salvation, because it is a gift of God. And if we could do anything to earn it, it would not be a gift. That's true. That's true. I just to chime in, my one of my one of my favorite Christmas gifts is is my Bible. Not that Nintendo's not but it's my parents' Total got it for Jesus me. Jew. Total <laughs> Jesus Jew. But my parents told me it would be the best gift they ever gave me and, and so true. But Nintendo's are pretty rad too, man. Uh, you know, my my takeaway, I am going to read the Bible and not Jesus juke you, but in all seriousness. Uh <laughs> My takeaway from this is, is actually one of my favorite verses out of Ephesians, and, and there's the whole book of Ephesians so rich with, with what Paul, the counsel he had for the church, but Greg shared Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and, and I want to remind us of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is gr by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one could boast. And I think I love that Paul puts it so plainly for us because it's a powerful reminder. There is nothing that we can do to add to the power of the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, as a means to our salvation. Like it, it is, it's either completely Jesus or it's completely not. And there's nothing that I can add to it. As Paul says, so that no one can boast. Like all of eternity, we're going to be worshiping Jesus because he got us there. We're not going to be sitting around the campfire in heaven going, hey, look what I did to get here. It will have nothing to do with that because it's not by our works. We, will have, we have nothing to boast in except, as Paul said elsewhere, except for Christ and him crucified. That's so good. So true, bro. And as I think about some tips that we can share with our youth leaders watching or listening, you know, Greg used a lot of great illustrations uh, that I he's think. He's good for object lessons, he's a good, man. Yeah, he's, he's a good, good illustration good. guy. <laughs> Stories and object lessons. He's kind of got that down. Uh, but no, seriously, like when we're looking at, uh, you know, how you could turn this into a talk or a Bible study in a small group setting or large group setting, whatever, uh, for your students. I mean, just the whole concept of white frosting on a burnt cake. Uh, certainly not that hard to burn a cake, right? <laughs> so uh, I, literally, I think that would be cool to take the time to, to burn a cake and then dress it up with that, that white frosting. And so whether you decide to get messy with it and let kids eat it, whatever, or just use it as a visual, and then it's the treat at the end. I just think that's a great illustration to show. And despite how good it looks on the outside, it's what matters on the inside. And so we can try to dress things up with our good works and our good deeds. But really, it's, it's what's on the inside, which we're spiritually dead. Uh, without right. without this gift of grace, this gift of salvation that has nothing to do uh, with our own works. That's it. That's it. Well, and the other object lesson he used real quick was the whole mirror versus ladder when talking about the law, that it's a reflection of the human heart. It's not the ladder by way we get to heaven. And so to have those props at the front of the room as you're teaching this lesson, just to, to show and demonstrate to students. But again, uh, Greg is, 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 
incredibly deep theologically, has great truth to bring us, but he's a master story storyteller and amazing object lesson. So burnt cake frosting, mirror ladder, great object lessons for youth ministry. Absolutely. And you need talks about that ladder and that trying to climb. I can't help but think, you know, all of the religions. I mean, that's what separates Christianity from all the rest. Right. It's all about trying to do enough good to please God, to get to God, whereas Christianity is so different in that, you know, Jesus came to us. God came uh, down to us. And so uh, really, uh, I think a great uh, tool that you can utilize for this is and when you're talking about uh, you know, what do other religions believe and how do you share the gospel with them and, and, and you know, those sort of things. We have, actually have a free resource right on our Dare to Share website, daretoshare.org. Uh, slash training slash worldviews just go to that and there's a list of of numerous several worldviews and 14 worldviews yeah 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 it talks about you know what they believe and then what we believe and how that's different and really even offers ways that you can use that the, as a as a segue into a gospel conversation and so just a, a great tool i think that our youth leaders could really find valuable and useful for their students and their ministry that is yeah a great tool and, and as john said free and uh, another resource that's out there we're in the midst of the life in six word series through the podcast that we're literally at the halfway point now but uh we have the life in six words curriculum for you to train your students the sermon series available but you can go to our website and you can download the youth curriculum for free the videos the student guides but the first person, the first person who emails me at podcast at dare to share dot org, podcast at dare to share dot org, uh, I will send you a physical copy of the curriculum if you're old school and like to have the DVD. And it's got uh, 10 of the student uh, listening guide or participant guides. And so great stuff in the curriculum. And this, whoever, again, first person to email podcast at dare to share dot org. I will send this to you and I will throw in a couple gospelized with Greg's yeah. dear podcast stickers so you can customize your own Drama. coffee mug just yeah. like I did. And so podcast at dare to share dot org. I'll get the curriculum and some stickers in the mail to you. And it's a gift, right? They don't have to pay you. Free, free gift of grace. So good. Grace, we didn't man. even plan that. Whoa, another Jesus Duke. I Come love on, it. I, I love it. Jesus Duke. I had to close this out with a Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Gospel Eyes uh, with Greg Steer. And we're so thankful for you to be a part of this ministry, this journey uh, with us. Listen, we're in this together. We're pr we pray for you daily. We love you. We're one team, one dream with one king. And, and as we advance the gospel together until every team everywhere hears the gospel from a friend, keep on pressing on. <laughs>